Greg Marchand here. Welcome to another episode of the Virtual Instructor-Led Training Program brought to you by the Service Sales Academy. In this episode, we're going to talk to you about creating customer trust. Now, your job as a service advisor is to remember this customer satisfaction pyramid. And we want to get as many customers as we possibly can to the point of trust the peak of the pyramid, right? Now we've discussed this in many of our instructor-led classes and we will again, trust me, because the more customers we can get to trust, the more customers that we're gonna be able to sell to and the more we're gonna be able to sell to them. Now you've gotta do two things before you can get to trust. You've gotta create an exceptional customer service experience and you've gotta combine that with fixed right first time. And remember, never forget that customer satisfaction equals customer retention. Now, customers that trust, they're going to refer two to three new customers per year to you for doing nothing other than your job, maybe. Customers that trust, they're going to spend more money with you. And more importantly to me, they're going to be easier to sell to. Why? Because they trust you. You ever tried to sell something to a friend? Sure you have. It wasn't even selling, was it? You're just saying, hey, dude, you need this. Oh, okay. And that's essentially what it's going to be like for a customer that trusts you. They're going to say, you know what, Jeannie? You say I need this? Great, I need it. Go ahead and do it. When will it be done? And because of that, your workday gets way more pleasant, and I don't think you can underestimate that whatsoever. Look, you spend a lot of time at work, you might as well be successful and enjoy it. In short, customers that trust you increase gross profits, and that's good for everybody. That's good for the shop owner, that's good for the shop as a whole, it's good for the technicians, and it's good for you, the service advisors. What's in the way of creating customer trust, though? <laughs> I hate to say it, but there's far too much in the way, unfortunately. There's a lot of anxiety when it comes to automotive repair, and that alone will get in the way. If you have anxiety or, or you, have, you have some fear of the unknown, then it's really hard to walk into a situation or a scenario where you can trust automatically. So that alone is a, is a big challenge, right? And then there's the reputation of the industry, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. Because let's face it, we don't have the best reputation amongst business or industry on the planet. And so we have the anxiety challenges that get in the way, we have the reputation of the industry that gets in the way, we have this huge fear of the unknown. Because look, customers don't know what you know. They don't have the same understanding of the automobile that even you have as a service advisor. And because of that, they feel, they feel a bit defensive. They, they feel like they can be taken advantage of. And then, of course, they know the industry reputation is to take advantage of them, especially if you're a woman. And so these things create significant anxiety, and they get in the way of that trust. And then, you know what? I hate to say it, but there may be some previous experience there that, that contributed as well. And so you've got these things, these hurdles, that you've got to climb over around or under to get a customer to the point of trust. You see, you've got to overcome this list. Now, I say often in class that you, you yourself, your repair shop, this repair shop did not create this list, but the industry created it over a long period of time. You see, I, I, I'm sure you, you hear this, you, you go to parties and gatherings and, and family events and, and somebody finds out you're in the automotive business and, and they say, oh, I gotta tell you something. And, you know, sometimes it's, I got a guy. They're awesome. But a lot of times it's, oh, man, I had, oh, I had a bad experience. What do you do if they rip you off? They never get it right. I have to take it to them six times for them to fix it. Uh, hopefully they don't think you're guessing at what's wrong, but they could be. They feel that we're dishonest. A lot of, a, a lot of people, unfortunately, think that we're, we're dirty. It's a dirty business. It's a, you know, greasy mechanic, grease monkey type thing. And you know what? It's probably not the cleanest thing we could be doing. But that doesn't mean we have to transfer it to their automobile. And so they don't have to have this, this anxiety, but they do. They think we're expensive. Hey, we are. Having an automobile repaired is expensive. There's nothing inexpensive about it anymore. It's just the way it is. And we're inconvenient. <laughs> yeah, we're inconvenient. You ever try going without your automobile? Sucks, doesn't it? So yes, auto repair is inconvenient. It can be an unpleasant experience. You've got to overcome all of these things that contribute to the customer's anxiety in order to create trust with the customer. Now, it's easy for you and I 
to say, well, we're not these things, they should just trust us. Of course, they should just trust us. We're in the business, right? We have, we have a different understanding of what goes on. We have a different understanding of why we charge what we charge, of why we do what we do, of why things take as long as they take, of why we can't get that part anywhere else, or why that part costs $733. We have a very different understanding than they do. And so it's, it's difficult sometimes for us to put ourselves on the other side of this counter and say, hey, you know what? I remember what it's like to be a customer. But you need to. Because think about what, I mean, why do they come to you? And I can give you the list and yeah, I'll let you read it, right? You know, the car's broken down. They need something repaired. Then maybe they need a state inspection. Maybe they need an emission sticker. Maybe the check engine light is on. The brake light is on. They, they don't want to go to the dealership. So one of these things happens and they're going to come to you. Well, that's great. We could come up with a list of reasons. But again, there's really only one reason. They don't have a choice. And so the fact that they need you, the fact that they don't know a whole lot about what's going on, that they can't take care of it them themselves, that they have to come to you, contributes to that anxiety. And that anxiety gets in the way of you being able to create trust. Now think of the customers that you do have trust with, whether it's this business or, or some other business that you were in. Why did those customers trust you? And did they trust you from day one? Yes, there were probably some that did trust you from day one because you did something. You connected to them in some way. But many customers, folks, are not going to connect to you day one. And you had to build the trust over time. You had to show them that you had a product or a service that could solve their problem, solve their pain, give them what they needed. And once you did that consistently and you did it with a smile on your face and you, and you did it for a reasonable price or you showed them what the value was, even if the price was, a, was, was high, you created trust with them. No different in this business, right? No different. If you're going to create trust, and I said earlier that, that you've, got to, you've got to create trust by creating exceptional customer service experience, by adding to that fixed right first time, and then you stand a chance in getting them to trust. Well, if you're going to create an exceptional customer service experience, what do you have to do? This is what you need to do. And, and you know, it's easy for me to write a list. And it's easy for, for you to look at the list and go, yeah, okay, Greg, no problem. But when we really take a look at the list, we discover that, boy, there's a lot that goes into creating customer trust. And you know what? We're not even going to get to fixed right first time in this program. Because the base of the pyramid is the exceptional customer service experience. And without that base, you can't have the rest of the pyramid. So think about this, an exceptional experience. What goes into that? Well, scheduling plays a part in that, believe it or not. Not just when you're going to schedule them, but how you schedule a customer. And then there's preparing for the visit. Sounds simple, and it is, but it's something that you can do to help create trust and help create that exceptional customer service experience. There's the write-up process itself. There's educating the customer, or what we might call selling to them. We'll save that for a different program. But there's that education piece. And then there's giving the vehicle back to them, which is oftentimes a forgotten piece of the whole transaction. And then there's this follow-through thing that, that I call follow-through, many call follow-up. It's that reconnecting to the customer, say, hey, thank you very much for your business. Don't forget what we talked about. We hope to see you again. Hey, can I make you that next appointment? So all of these pieces, these six things, have to go into creating that exceptional customer service experience. Now, you've got tools that can help with scheduling. Let's talk about scheduling first. And I think one of the biggest pieces to scheduling, and, and in the instructor led class, we'll talk a lot more about this. But I think one of the biggest pieces to scheduling is to encourage drop-offs. You know, I did some, some work in Europe recently, and I was touring a whole bunch of independent auto repair shops. And it dawned on me on, on the second day, I think, that there was something really different here. And at first, I couldn't figure out what it was. But I realized that there were no customers. Where are the customers? You get a lot full of cars, but there are no customers. And then I realized, Hey, there's no waiting room. There's no place for the customer to hang out. Well, the culture where I was in Europe was such that customers did not wait to have their automobile serviced. Can you create that customer? Can you create that culture for your customer? Maybe. I know shops that do. Uh, you know, look, I, I had a guy in class say to me one day, Greg, I, I bought the most uncomfortable, dirtiest, filthiest chairs you can imagine and put them in my waiting room so that nobody would want to sit and wait for the, wait for the car to be worked on. I said, well, that's one way of handling it. 
I think I would rather encourage drop-offs. If I can make it convenient, if I can solve the convenience problem for the customer, maybe I can then encourage them to drop the vehicle off with me so that they're not as inconvenienced. Because certainly, them dropping the vehicle off with me is not only a scheduling thing, but it's a convenience factor for me, the service advisor, and me, the repair shop as well, right? So can you set things up so that you have a, a, a discounted rental vehicle? Some shops offer free rental vehicles. Well, no, there's nothing really free about it. It's buried in the cost of the repair, but the customer feels like they're getting a free rental car. They're not inconvenienced, and they love having that shop work on their automobile because of that. So maybe you can create a drop-off scenario where you offer a free rental car, or at least a greatly discounted rental automobile. Can you provide a shuttle service? That's, that's you know, 40, 50 years old now, but hey, it still works. Many shops are shuttling customers, and the customers have come to expect that, and they certainly come to appreciate that. In metro areas, can you offer free public transportation tokens to customers? to help them get to and from work or to and from their house or to and from the, the shopping center if they want to. That works for, for some shops, it works for many shops in metro areas actually. Now, you can also encourage drop-offs by reminding customers that hey, we've got early bird drop-off forms. And you can use these forms if you want to leave it with me in the morning, just leave me your name, your phone number, put the car keys in it, I've got you in the system and I'll give you a call if we have any challenges. Sometimes customers don't realize that they can do that. You may have offered that service for the last 10, 15, 20 years, but they still don't realize that they can do that. So are there ways, are there tools that you can, you can encourage customers to drop the vehicle with you to help ease some of your scheduling challenges? There are. And, and, and one of the biggest tools you have are the telephone skills. And I think this, this might be your biggest tool in encouraging drop-offs. Um, <clears throat> and, and many shops can tell funny stories about this, but I, I used to say to customers, what time will we be dropping the vehicle off? Or, if you can drop it off with me first thing in the morning, it will allow me to get it diagnosed, the parts ordered, and repaired in the, in the most timely manner possible. Now, I've had shops tell me that, oh, you know what, Greg, customers just like to wait, they like to wait, they like to wait, and I say, look, just keep trying this, just keep encouraging, what time will you drop it off, what time will you drop it off? And I had a, a shop come to me one day, and he says, I got the funniest story. A woman calls me up, I said to her, what time will you be dropping it off? And she says, oh, I'm going to wait for it. So I tried, if you drop it off with me first thing in the morning, it will allow me to, just what we said here. And she says, well, I'm going to wait for it. And I said, well, I would, you know, if, if you could drop it off at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, that would, be, that would be fantastic. Now he says, I hung up the phone fully expecting her to drop it off. She shows up at 8 o'clock the next morning with a ride. So sometimes it's just planting these, these messages, planting these seeds, to get customers to understand this is, this is what we need to do. This is, this is the convenience that we offer you if you can drop it off to us. And a lot of that comes down to your verbal skills, your telephone skills. So work on those. Get better at those. Now, once you, once you kind of smooth out the scheduling piece, and, and, and we'll talk a lot more about this in class, but then you've got to pr prepare for the visit. Because I've made the appointment, I know when I'm going to bring the automobile in, and what does it say? What message does it send? If I come walking through the door and you have no idea who I am, you have no idea what time I was supposed to be here, and you're not really all that sure what you're doing, it doesn't send a good message, does it? And so we want to prepare for that customer's visit. We want to know what the service history of the automobile is. And if we know the service history, we might be able to make an upsell right there at the counter before the customer even leaves the shop. If we know the service history, we might also prepare ourselves or the technician for what we may need to do today based on whatever the customer concern is. We can also check on pre-ordered parts and make sure they're here. And then we can give the customer a quick call if they're not here just to avoid them having to come in and be inconvenienced again if we don't happen to have the parts. We want to prepare for the visit. We can also check the manufacturer's recommended maintenance schedule so we can have that. That kind of goes with vehicle history. We can check for declined services so we can be prepared to have that conversation. And also, if we're doing this the day before, it helps us set up the shop workflow. It helps us know who has what jobs tomorrow. We can even pre-dispatch if we start to prepare for this customer's visit because we know who ordered the parts, who looked at it last, who, you know, who does the customer prefer to work on this vehicle. And we can pre-dispatch, we can set the workflow for tomorrow 
today, which which does a number of things that we'll talk about in the in the future. And then you know the the staging piece is really that pre-dispatch piece, but we can go pull the parts. We can deliver the parts to the technician. We can say, hey, Johnny Technician, this is your, your first job tomorrow morning. You know, if you want to come in early, go ahead and get started on it. No problem. And believe it or not, it's a tool that I use very often to increase productivity in repair shops. So prepare for the customer's visit because it sends a message that, hey, we were expecting you. We're prepared for you to be here. We are fast. We're efficient. And everything is going to be great. So we've got the customer schedule. We've prepared for the visit a little bit, and we'll talk more about scheduling in, in another episode. Now let's talk about the write-up process. See, I think it is maybe the most important aspect of the overall customer service. The write-up is, is when the customer interacts with you, right? Now, yes, they can do this over the phone as well, but generally when they walk through the door, now they can see your body language, they can see the facility, they can get a feel for how this is going to go. It sets the tone of the overall experience for them. It can set a positive tone, right? Which is what we hope it does. Because if we do, and it allows the customer, I'm sorry, the technician to do the best job possible, but it can also set a negative tone. And we don't want that. We want it to create the positive experience, not the negative experience. We don't want it to confirm the customer's worst fears. So pay attention to the write-up process. Look, telephone skills that we'll talk about in another episode are critically important. Scheduling is critically important. Preparing for the customer's visit is critically important. This is when the customer actually shows up. And how this goes may dictate how the rest of your day, as well as their day, is going to go. So pay attention to the write-up process. Now, part of the write-up process are these customer expectations. And I hear all the time, Greg, customer expectations are out of control. Customers expect too much. They, they're this and they're that. And, and, and are they crazy? Well, you know what? Customer expectations are customer ex expectations. All we can do is manage it. Because here's what I have to say about customer expectations. If you don't set the expectations, they're going to set them for themselves. And that's not something that you want. Right? Because if I don't tell the customer when I'm going to call them back or what they can expect in terms of the, the vehicle being finished in a time frame maybe, then they're going to make up one in their own head. And it may or may not agree with what <laughs> I'm thinking or what the reality of the situation is in the, in the shop. So managing expectations is a key to satisfying customers because you've got to get out in front of this. You've got to set these expectations or they will set them the, themselves. Now also keep in mind, that what they don't expect is just as important as what they do expect. They don't expect handprints. They don't expect footprints. They don't expect uh, uh, floor mats and seat covers still in their car when they come to pick it up. They don't expect the estimate not to match, I'm sorry, the invoice not to match the estimate. So these things that they don't expect are just as important as the things that they do expect. But managing that customer service experience is really the key to avoiding conflict to begin with. So whether we're talking about managing upset customers or creating positive customer satisfaction, getting more customers to the point of trust, a lot of it has to do with managing expectations. Now there are a few other things that go into this, but keep this in mind. What do customers expect? I can tell you this, they expect to be listened to. And so your listening skills are one of those things that do play, in, play a part in this. They play right into managing customer expectations. Customers expect to be listened to first and foremost. That's number one. They also expect to have their concerns addressed. I mean, you would too, right? You bring a television into the TV repair guy. I know it's going back a few years. But you bring a TV into the TV repair guy, and you expect the TV to be fixed. Is that unreasonable? No. They expect that that product, your TV, their automobile, is going to be respected. Is that unreasonable? Heck no, it's not unreasonable, is it? And they expect to receive value for their money. So they don't want to just spend money willy-nilly. They want to receive value for the money. They want to know that not only was the problem taken care of, but they got maybe some extras. They got exceptional customer service, along with fixed right first time. But remember, the number one customer expectation is to be listened to. Now, let's talk about the education piece. This is really the, the selling piece. In, in, in a short program like this, we don't have time to go through the whole selling thing, but we got another program on that, and we're going to have a whole instructor-led class on that. The education piece, I think, really, if I was to boil it down to, to any single best tool that you could use, it would be these inspection forms. Because a lot of what we do 
in auto repair is about inspection forms. Whether it's brake inspections, whether it's pre-alignment inspections, whether it's courtesy inspections, they are a critical selling tool. And so in terms of sales, in terms of educating the customer, I really push on these because it's a relationship building tool if it's used in a collaborative manner. And we will talk more about using your, your inspection form to generate more sales, to generate more customer visits, to generate higher customer satisfaction in a future program. But, but pay attention to your courtesy inspections because it is that customer relationship building tool. And if you use it right, you will actually increase the number of visits. If you, the, one of the keys here is that you have to, have to, have to use that form every single time that that customer comes into the shop. And I mean every single time. I don't mean, uh, I don't feel like doing it today, we're going to move on from it. I don't mean the customer was just here last month, I don't need to do another one. Yes, you do. Because what you really, really want the customer to do is get used to seeing everything good on that form. If they see all the green boxes checked or everything marked good or excellent or, or whatever, very good condition, as soon as something moves away from that condition and moves to may need something soon, might need a future repair, yellow instead of green, then they want it back to green. They want it back to good. They want it back to excellent condition. So if you're consistent with it and you get them used to seeing good, 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 not only will you build more trust with them because they know you'll show them the good stuff as well as when the car needs $2,000 worth of work, but psychologically you're also going to set yourself up for more selling success by using this very tool. All right? It's also a tool for prioritizing repairs and maintenance. You see, if you prioritize it based on safety, needed repairs, preventative maintenance, maybe upcoming seasonal stuff or upcoming repairs, then we can also break it into smaller pieces. And if it is a $2,000 estimate, we can break it into, into you know, a bunch of $400 estimates and help them budget for it. That will increase the number of visits. It will also show them that you care about them, that they can trust you to help with their repairs, to help help them make decisions to help make their life easier because they need their automobile and it freaks them out when the automobile has a lot of work that needs to be done and maybe they don't have the money for it. So the inspection form can be a significant relationship building tool to be used for future sales as well as current sales today. Focus on it. Now, one of the challenges to creating customer trust is this estimating thing. And unfortunately, estimates do go wrong even if we don't want them to. Accurate estimates, uh, look, you and I know an estimate's an estimate. It's, it's, the, it's the best guess we have as to what it's going to cost to take care of this concern. But to a customer, it's a price tag. Okay? And so I say that, yeah, estimates can be a bit of an oxymoron in the automotive business. Because, look, until we take something apart, sometimes we don't know what's going to be involved in making the repair, what parts we're going to need, or what kind of labor is going to be involved. But we have to get it as close as we possibly can because we've got to set the right expectation in order to get the right result. If you can focus on collecting good information so the technician knows what the right problem is that they're diagnosing, so they diagnose it properly, so the right parts get ordered, then we stand a better chance of getting the estimate to match the invoice at the end of the day. But no matter what, you've got to be as transparent as possible. If you know the invoice isn't going to match the estimate at the end of the day, then pick up the phone and call the customer and let them know what you've run into. Let them know what the difference is. Do not wait until they show up and for heaven's sake, don't wait until I go home figuring that, or you go home rather, figuring I'll still be here when the customer shows up and oh, Greg can explain it for them. All right, be as transparent as possible. You run into problems, I know it, I get it. Sometimes the estimates aren't right. Sometimes the invoice amount is different. But call the customer and let them know what's going on. Because they will feel like they couldn't trust you if those numbers don't match when they show up. Now sometimes over-promising and under-delivering is a, is a great way of handling this. But think about when estimates might go wrong. Repair takes longer than we expect it to. We need more parts. Technician skill was an issue because we didn't get a good diagnosis or it was a partial diagnosis. Maybe the write-up process, maybe I forget to get all the information. Maybe I, I neglect to get all the information. And so the technician can't possibly diagnose it properly. Maybe I don't even know what the customer's talking about. 
So there are many things that can go wrong, but communication is critical. If you communicate well with the customer, and I encourage you to watch the communication video, if you communicate well with the customer, you can prepare a better estimate that's more likely to match the invoice amount at the end of the day. Be honest with the customer every step of the way. And again, under promise and over deliver is, is sometimes a good policy. I know shops bumping the estimate 20% just in case. So they, they sell the job for $400 and the customer comes in and it's $320. And oh, we're all excited. All right. Use the customer problem analysis sheet that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit to gather better information from the customer. This is a, this is a sheet that, that just helps you remember to ask certain questions and it helps to engage the customer. Okay, so if you can do all of these things and if you, you can use them to create an exceptional customer service experience and add to that fixed right first time, you're going to come out ahead. You'll create customer trust and your job will get easier and your sales will, will increase. All right, more to follow in the next class, folks. Until next time, keep up the great work and never stop learning.